Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to see you. Thank you. So it was the close of the 19th century. And in a small, modest home on Bright Avenue in Uptown Whittier, California, amidst a time of extraordinary revival among the Friends denomination that 10 God-fearing visionary women and men gathered together, believing that a Los Angeles-based training school was desperately needed to teach, promote, and train young men and women for global missions. The minutes from that historic meeting dated March 3rd, 1899 said this, the necessity of a training school for Christian workers having long been felt by a number met at the home of Felina B. Hadley. The cardinal points of Orthodox faith were presented as essential in the formation of such a school. Nearly all present spoke of the deep impression that had been with them as to the need of such, in which plain teaching of Bible truths and doctrines with spiritual application and earnestness could be obtained. The APU archives tell us that at the close of this meeting, the 10 women and men entered into a deep season of earnest prayer in which each one participated. News of this initial meeting spread quickly throughout the Friends denomination, and the promise of a training school for Christian workers was described as electrifying. This visionary band of leaders chose the name Training School for Christian Workers, and the original Articles of Incorporation approved on March 12th 1900 stated that the purpose of this new, new school was not for pecuniary profit, but primarily to provide thorough instruction in the Bible and to give practical training in all that pertains to home and foreign missions work and to give such aid to such workers as may be practical that said corporation shall have the power to engage in evangelism and the raising up of new work for the kingdom of Christ the establishing of the same and shall have the power necessary and incidental to do all and everything necessary to the promotion of the kingdom of Christ on the face of the world. The leadership team of this training school for Christian workers was adamant that a strict evangelical confession of faith be made part of the Articles of Incorporation. The training school believed unabashedly in the Trinity of the Godhead, the deity of Jesus Christ our Lord, the inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, the fall of man, the judgment of God, the justification through faith in Jesus Christ, the sanctification of believers, the imminent coming again of Jesus, and the speedy evangelization of the world. At the final meeting of this founding committee held in the early 1900s, plans were approved to open the training school for Christian workers, and it did so just a few days later. The first classes were held in Hadley's home with an inaugural class of just two students with teachers receiving no salary. And by the end of the term, enrollment grew to 12 with growing interest and local pastors offering to join the faculty. The archives tell us that most classes were religious in content with Bible classes receiving special attention and the experience of sanctification emphasized as a goal to which all should strive to attain. The history I've just shared with you this morning is our history. It's the founding history of this institution, and you're hearing afresh today the heart and deep convictions of our founders and the values upon which APU was established. What began as a training school for Christian workers grew to become Pacific Bible College, then Azusa College, followed by Azusa Pacific College, and today Azusa Pacific University. And we know that APU's history is replete with remarkable men and women of God whom he has used to advance his mission throughout the world. People like Dr. William Marshburn, an adept businessman and esteemed physician who served as board chair in 1906. The Marshburn family has played a significant role throughout our rich history, and we're blessed to have Dr. Marshburn's great-granddaughter, Lynette Eilertson, serving on our board of trustees today. Members of the Marshburn family are with us here this morning, and we welcome you once again to the APU campus. I'm reminded of Dr. Cornelius Haggard, who attended the training school from 1930 to 1933, and later served as a bookkeeper and a part-time teacher. 
Believing it was time for leadership with renewed energy and vision, the training school's board of directors had taken notice of young Cornelius. And in a letter dated uh, November 12, 1938, sent to the 27-year-old former student, he was informed that he had just been selected the training school's new president. It's been said that the 1930s were among the most discouraging of the early years of the training school for Christian workers. That time represented the worst of the Great Depression, resulting in plummeting enrollment, a reduction in faculty and staff, and the physical infrastructure, the training school's actual buildings were said to be decrepit and in great disrepair. Dr. Haggard's 36-year presidency was that of a turnaround, leading the training school out of intense hardship into a thriving, fully accredited liberal arts college. Dr. Haggard was an instrumental leader, and his daughter, Ruth Prevett, has joined us here today. Ruth, we honor your father's legacy here this morning, and we welcome you again to the APU campus. Our history is also marked by people like Dr. Cliff Hamlow, class of 1956, whose APU story, story began as a student and later as a coach, and then dean and eventually executive vice president. Dr. Hamlow's APU legacy spans 70 years, and his impact on this institution was profound. It's an honor to have Cliff and his dear wife, June, married now for more than 60 years here with us this morning. And Dr. Dr. and Mrs. Hamlow, we welcome you again to the APU campus. I also think about a former student named Carolyn Kuhns, who in 1962, while studying at Azusa Pacific College, heard a chapel message from then President Haggard, who encouraged students to look for the mission field around them. Carolyn decided to travel to Mexico, and she saw firsthand the opportunity to form local partnerships to reach this community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Carolyn soon began leading groups of students down to Mexicali, and as word spread and momentum grew, it wasn't long before local churches began asking Azusa Pacific if their own youth groups could accompany us on these trips. Carolyn founded Mexico Outreach, a venture that became an established ministry outpost for so many. Over the past 60 years, literally hundreds of Azusa students have traveled and ministered in villages beyond our southern border, a seed that was planted decades ago in the heart of an Azusa Pacific student while sitting in a morning chapel. Carolyn Coons is with us this morning, and we welcome you back to the APU campus. And we do, we, we thank you for the courage and conviction that you mustered as a young college student to listen to the voice of God and to go outside of your comfort zone to do great things for Christ and his kingdom. In 1970, President Haggard had just returned from an alumni trip to the Far East, connecting with Azusa Pacific College missionaries who were having a profound gospel impact in places like Korea, Singapore, and Hong Kong. Dr. Haggard would often say that the sun never sets on the work of Azusa Pacific College missionaries all around the world. And he was right, he traveled often, wanting to see firsthand the impact our students and graduates were having to advance the kingdom of God. Upon his return from this specific trip to the Far East, Dr. Haggard observed a large crowd of hippies that were gathered on the library lawn. This is the 1970s. Lots of hippies, apparently. Dr. Haggard wondered what could have possibly happened to Azusa Pacific College in my absence. He quickly learned that his students, including a young man named Ron Turner, were concerned about the, quote, footloose, unwashed youth in the area and had begun ministering to them. In a letter from Ron Turner to President Haggard, he shared that what started as a gathering of 35 young hippies quickly soared to a group of 200. Turner wrote that this semester alone, six have given their lives to Jesus Christ. At Turner's invitation, President Haggard soon visited this group where he began to preach. Haggard was thrilled with what was happening at Azusa Pacific College. And he said, quote, there is an air of expectancy on the Azusa Pacific College campus, and there is a reason for it. In an exploding age that sweeps aside old concepts and ideas, an age that has no patience with the status quo, and earnestly questions long accepted notions, our college has remained relevant to the needs of our students as few colleges have. 
About this same time, another historic movement of God was about to occur. It was February 1970, and students gathered for chapel in the impressive new Turner Center, Turner Campus Center. It was a moment that's been described as a special moving of the Holy Spirit that found its roots some 2,000 miles away at Asbury College in Wilmore, Kentucky. It was during a chapel service at Asbury College that a spiritual awakening began, a revival, if you will, where students began praying, testifying, and asking for forgiveness. Our university archives tell us that the intensity inspired not only the Asbury student body, but also the faculty, the Wilmore, Kentucky community, and residents from miles around. People from all over began to descend on the Asbury campus to join in the tears, confessions, conversions, and praises. It's been said that the crowds overflowed the Asbury Chapel, forcing the student body to move to an auditorium, and classes were canceled as the services continued day and night. News of the Asbury revival went viral, to use our modern language, meaning that telephone lines were jammed and countless messages were being sent by telegraph. When the Asbury News reached Azusa Pacific College, Noble Henson, student body president, called the Asbury student body president and invited him to come here to our campus to tell our students about the movement of the Holy Spirit in their community. And so it was in a chapel service here on our campus in February 1970 that the Asbury student body president told our students about their campus revival and gave his testimony. There was apparently nothing spectacular about his presentation. He simply shared what the Lord had done for him and for his fellow classmates. Our Azusa Pacific Chapel team here at the time, they hadn't really prepared for any sort of formal response from our students. They simply wanted the Asbury story told. But God had something far greater in mind. We read that it happened spontaneously. Azusa Pacific students began talking to God some went forward and dropped to their knees and prayed. Some knelt and prayed where they were. Many began to testify. Some confessed and some asked for forgiveness. There was electricity in the air. Students were crying, laughing, and embracing each other. Chapel did not close at the appointed hour. No one rushed out. It went on into the afternoon. The chapel service continued, students, for seven hours, and were told that services were held that night in the residence halls. Revival, my friends, had reached the Azusa Pacific campus. Within days, Azusa Pacific students gave testimony in churches all across Southern California of how God had moved on this very campus. Before long, Azusa students had canvassed the state of California, reaching out to dozens of colleges and scores of churches. Amidst the movement of the Holy Spirit, a local pastor wrote to President Haggard and said this, the dozen Azusa Pacific students who came here last Sunday are a splendid group of Christian young people. The Lord mightily blessed their witness for him. Upon giving an altar call, the entire 50-foot width of the front of our sanctuary was full of kneeling people. Many were led of the Lord to give public testimony, and deeply moved was the congregation with what was just done. Timid people suddenly became bold. Some confessed Christ as Savior. Some got right with another Christian. May the Lord keep on using your students, he wrote, to bring revival to the churches of this needy area. You see, what began with Azusa student Ron Turner, who felt called by God to begin ministering to the footloose and unwashed hippies in our local community, coupled with the efforts of student body president Noble Henson, who took the initiative to bring the Asbury student body president to this campus, sparked a Holy Spirit revival here at Azusa Pacific, resulting in thousands and thousands of men and women across this great state finding victory in Jesus Christ. Two students, Noble Henson and Ron Turner, who simply responded to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Another hero of Azusa Pacific story is Dr. Richard Felix. And we're sitting today, of course, in the Felix Event Center. And Dr. Felix, whom we just heard from, is with me here on the platform this morning. He's joined today by his dear wife, Susan, and we again welcome you to the APU community. <laughs> Dr. Felix served as our 15th president from August 1st, 1990 until June 30th, 2000. 
and was applauded by former President John Wallace for leading Azusa Pacific University through what many considered to be the most significant decade in the first hundred years of our history. Dr. Felix's leadership was marked by humility and transparency. He was a man committed to mission, and the APU community honors you today, Dr. Felix, for your years of faithful service. And I do want to express my deep personal gratitude, Dr. Felix, for your prayers, for your faithful support, and for the growing friendship that we're building and enjoying together. We're also joined today by the family of beloved APU president, the late Dr. John Wallace. This morning, yes, that's right. This morning, I want to express our deep love and admiration for Dr. John Wallace, and today we recognize our former First Lady, Dr. Gail Wallace, who herself was a valued and cherished member of this community, serving as professor, mentor, and friend to so many. Dr. Gail Wallace. <laughs> Dr. Gail Wallace stood alongside her husband, who faithfully served APU for 42 years holding multiple positions, first as Director of Security and Housing, later as Vice President for Student Life, then Executive Vice President, and finally the 16th President of Azusa Pacific University. I met Dr. Wallace only once, but I have always held him in high regard. He was one of the first to reach out to my colleague, Dr. Barry Corey, President of Biola University, when the Corey family moved here from Boston to take the helm at Biola. I was struck by Dr. Wallace's deep character that he would reach out to a neighboring president at a rival institution to offer his genuine love and support. Dr. Corey spoke generously of Dr. Wallace and the collective work they were doing together to safeguard and advance the great work of Christian higher education here in California and across the nation. And all of us in Christian higher education are indebted to these two men for their faithful work on our behalf. For me now, stepping into this role as your 18th president, I can tell you that hardly a week goes by that I don't hear the name John Wallace mentioned by someone in this community. His love for faculty, staff, and students, his pastor's heart, his entrepreneurial drive, his commitment to mission, his incredible work ethic, his walk with God, and his optimism for APU's future. The impact Dr. John Wallace had on this place during his 42 years of service cannot be understated, and to our dear friend, Dr. Gail Wallace, this community loves you, and you will always be welcome here. <laughs> Pausing this morning to remember poignant moments and specific people from APU's past is both healthy and wise, and it's biblical, and it's fitting for a day like today. You see, there hasn't been an inauguration here since Dr. Wallace was installed on April 4th, 2001. It was 21 years ago. And my guess is that in an audience of this size, many here do not know of our rich history or of the men and women who've gone before us. The psalmist writes, I remember the days of old. I meditate on all that you've done. I ponder the work of your hands. You see, recalling moments from our past is really an invitation to reflect on God's goodness and faithfulness and to acknowledge all that God has done. And though my examples here this morning are few among the thousands of people used by God to advance this great institution, we know that today, the 21st day of September in the year 2022, as a collection of God's people gathered here on the APU campus and watching on the live stream around the globe, we can say with the utmost confidence that throughout our 124-year history, God has been faithful. He was faithful to the training school for Christian workers. He was faithful to Pacific Bible College. He was faithful to Azusa College and to Azusa Pacific College. And he's been faithful to the work and mission and ministry of Azusa Pacific University. My address this morning is not intended to focus very much on the business side of APU or to tell you my vision for APU's future. I've been on the job now for just 12 weeks, and as I shared with our faculty and staff just a few weeks ago, I believe that vision is God-breathed and will emerge as we seek God's will together. Do we know what our priorities are for the year ahead? We certainly do. Among them include developing a three- to five-year financial roadmap, growing our enrollment, and reinvesting in our infrastructure. 
We'll be intentional in clearly articulating our unique position in Christian higher education and we'll make it unquestionably clear who we are, what we believe, and how we will serve our diverse student body. We'll bring clarity to our strategic plan. We'll re-engage the community as we chart a course for our exciting future. We're building the executive team this year and we're praising God for our newly appointed interim provost, our new vice president for finance and administration and chief financial officer, our new vice president for enrollment management and our recently appointed interim vice president for advancement. We'll work together this year as a community to continue our pursuit of academic excellence, supporting our faculty and furthering our influence as an R2 research institution. We'll invest heavily in technology and be both prayer driven and metrics informed and we'll spend intentional time this year on community well-being restoring the strong sense of community that was disrupted amidst the constraints of budget and the hardest of days during the pandemic. Yes, there is much to do, and I couldn't be more optimistic for our future, but I would be remiss today if I didn't ground us yet again in our sacred, time-honored mission. The mission and purpose of Azusa Pacific University is to stand firm as an evangelical Christian community of disciples and scholars who seek to advance the work of God in the world through academic excellence in the liberal arts and professional programs of higher education that encourage students to develop a Christian perspective of truth and life. You see, APU is an institution that is unapologetically Christ-centered with a deep commitment to academic excellence, a global Great Commission mindset, and a passion to touch the lives of our beloved and diverse student body. Do we know what we believe here at APU? We absolutely do. We believe the Bible to be the inspired, infallible, authoritative Word of God. We believe there is one God, creator of heaven and earth, eternally existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ in his virgin birth, his sinless life, his miracles, his atoning death on the cross, his bodily ascension to the right hand of God the Father and his personal return to power and glory. We believe in the fall of humanity resulting in our lost estate, necessitating our regeneration by the Holy Spirit. That verse, right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. We believe in the present and continuing ministry of sanctification by the Holy Spirit empowering Christ's followers to live lives of holiness, obedience, and service. We believe that those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ will spend eternity with him, and we believe in the spiritual unity of believers in our Lord Jesus Christ. It's having these truths as the bedrock upon which this university stands that allows us to emphatically claim the words that are inscribed on the east wall of this arena that say, God first. God is preeminent in the classroom as our world-class faculty takes seriously the integration of faith and learning across all the disciplines. It's God first in our co-curricular programs, including the times each week this community gathers for chapel. It's God first among our student athletes as they compete in the NCAA. It's God first as our faculty conduct research and curate their published works. It's God first in the hiring of faculty and staff and in our service to the entire student body. And it's God first as thousands of current APU students and alumni permeate the marketplace as interns and employees serving in clinics, churches, studios, hospitals, classrooms, boardrooms, courtrooms, on the mission field, in small businesses, and so much more. Friends, we are living in difficult times marked by political, social, and racial unrest. And if ever there was a time for a rising generation of young men and women grounded in the truth of God's word to be released into the world, equipped to be salt and light, it is now. And I can tell you today that though the external pressures facing all of Christian higher education are on the rise, Azusa Pacific University will not capitulate on its deep-seated biblical convictions and institutional mission. This morning, I've shared with you a few of the names of ordinary APU men and women who were used at strategic moments in our history to do extraordinary things for God, several of whom were Azusa Pacific students at the time. And I know that today, sitting among us here in the Felix Event Center and joining us online is a generation of APU students, current students, 
who share that same passion for the Great Commission. And so as you look at the students sitting around you, you might see Jose, one of our doctoral students, whose dissertation will address how an app plus artificial intelligence will allow the hearing impaired to engage fully in weekly church services and activities. Jose's work could very well transform how the hearing impaired utilize technology in order to engage with the local church. Sam is likely with us this morning, a student in our social work program with a huge heart to care for and support the more than 300 veterans and military families enrolled at APU today. I wonder how God might use Sam to reach those who serve so faithfully in the armed forces. Holly is likely in the room here this morning, a senior nursing major whose APU journey has included evangelistic work in New York and overseas missions outreach in South Africa. Holly graduates from APU this December and wants to use her nursing skills to reach communities all over the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Grace is likely with us this morning as well, a senior honors humanities and interdisciplinary studies major with a deep passion for local community engagement and a huge heart for community development in Spain. And I wonder how many lives Grace will touch and how God might use her to accomplish his purposes in Spain and throughout the region of Southwestern Europe. You're also surrounded this morning by some of the hundreds of students who were in discipleship groups last semester, discovering what it means to be a committed follower of Jesus Christ and still others in this arena who made their faith known last semester as they entered the waters of baptism. This means that the likes of Cliff Hamlow, Carolyn Coons, Noble Henson, Ron Turner, John Wallace, Richard Felix, these are seated among us right now, right? Thousands of current APU students like Jose, Sam, Holly, and Grace, who, like those who have gone before them, have or are about to take huge risks for God, who will listen to the Holy Spirit and will venture out in faith and obedience and are about to do things so great that it will be unquestionably clear that in this APU community, God is on the move. Long before reading about the Azusa Pacific Revival of 1970 and during my presidential journey to APU that began actually a year ago next Thursday, the Lord put the word revival on my heart. And for many months now, the word has only increased in intensity. J.I. Packer, who wrote the foreword in Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones' famed work called Revival, tells us that the late Dr. Lloyd-Jones anchored revival in a new quality of spiritual life that comes through knowing the greatness and nearness of our holy, gracious creator. The divine visitation that revives, Dr. Lloyd-Jones argued, cannot be precipitated by human effort. Revival begins in the human heart, he says, with a deepened sense of the power and authority of God in the preaching of the biblical message. To acknowledge our present helplessness, says Dr. Lloyd-Jones, and to cry to God for such a visitation is, as he pleaded, a supreme priority for the church today. And Dr. Lloyd-Jones concluded by saying that until we grasp the need for revival, it will not happen until we see that nothing else will help. And so, dear friends, I've begun to pray for revival here on the Azusa Pacific University campus. And this morning, I invite you to please do the same. It's hard for me to put into words how strong my sense is that God is about to do something big here, something new, something even miraculous in our midst. I can tell you that I sense it, I can't yet see it, but I do believe it's coming. It's what President Haggard so colorfully described as an air of expectancy. During my interview process with the Board of Trustees, I told the leadership of this great university that I wanted to be part of something so big that only God could do it. And it's that hopeful expectation of what God will do in our midst that motivates and encourages me to join each one of you on this epic adventure we call Azusa Pacific University. I want you to know that Faith and I are humbled. I want you to know that Faith and I are humbled and honored and thrilled beyond measure to be here at APU at this time in our history, to lock arms with each one of you and to be about the work of Jesus Christ so that together we can touch the lives of thousands of students and alumni in such a way that their lives are transformed 
and they become agents of the gospel for the expansion of God's kingdom. And so thank you to the board of trustees, to the faculty, staff, and students of Azusa Pacific University. I am humbly standing on the shoulders of 17 other presidents and countless other faculty and staff who have gone before me, and I do pledge my service to God and to this community for his glory and for his name's sake. So thank you for welcoming the Morris family into this community and for receiving us with such kindness and grace. We love you. We cannot wait to see what God will do here in the months and years to come. APU, God is definitely on the move, so be encouraged. Thank you.